Okay. Oh my gosh. This is my third episode of chatting with, and I have the wonderful Frank Zapatella with me. Um, I'm probably pointing to the wrong direction because I, I don't know how it records, but we'll find out. Uh, if you are enjoying this series, and this episode in particular, please subscribe and like and comment. Uh, leave a comment, uh, which is the best Friday the 13th movie? Uh, and uh, on that note, <laughs> I have Frank here. How are you doing, Frank? Uh, doing well. Considered. Yeah. You were probably one of the first people to... Uh, remind me to stay social during this whole lockdown. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. Was that I, our, first, our happy hour, the first one we did a few weeks back? Yeah, I remember... Well, actually, almost two months ago now, right? Yeah, it's crazy. I remember that when you called, like, I was like, I don't know, I, did we schedule? A, and then I realized, like, oh, yeah, back, back in the olden days, we used to just call people when we were thinking of them. Yeah. <laughs> and... <pretty much. laughs> So I was like, oh yeah, let's let's all, you know, you, me, and Clay, let's all have a nice happy hour. And that was that was lovely. I mean, I think it's important. Yeah, it We're all like kind of deprived right now of that normal interaction. Yeah. And I wouldn't say that that's it's not normal interaction. It actually to me it feels very like surreal when I get into yeah. these like video hangouts. Like I feel like I'm in some weird dystopian future. Yeah. But, uh, it's better than not seeing people at all. You know I mean? Yeah, yeah, and and you know, you and I have talked about the nature of kind of being more homebodies anyway, and so like, even though the anxiety of what's going on in the world right now, we take comfort in like the things that we can be introspective about, and you know, you read right. a lot, you you watch great movies, and you're you you're writing, and you know, so what anything uh, interesting that you've watched lately that you'd like to share? Um, I watched Knives Out and I really enjoyed that. It's a great one. And last night I watched Bad Boys for Life because I was going <laughs> to move to some kind of comedic, just mindless action. And it was actually really awesome. That, that sounds like a, that's a fun pairing actually. I, I was, I was surprised like, uh, Will Smith and Martin Lawrence, like they rocked it. Like they were both like amazing. Yeah. Will Smith's action sequence were incredible I mean I know it's a stunt guy but still like it just it was great it was like really I thought it was great it was yeah fun. no sometimes it's fun to just watch like action just totally like it's almost like you just live through it and like it just gets rid of all your anxiety and you just focus on what the physical action is in the film yeah for sure so, one of the questions I've been asking all my guests uh is uh it's kind of open-ended but like what is your your North Star, like what is your driving force, especially in these kinds of times, or when you make your art, like what qualifies as like a, as your signature? Like what are your guiding principles, your core values in your art? I, I don't know that I consciously have a guiding principle or a core value, I guess, and I'm sure we all do, but I try not to think too deeply into what, what I'm trying to say on purpose. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, but I, I think what, what drives the art that I do is basically I want to do something that like I would find cool and enjoyable and meaningful because I feel like if I find it cool, enjoyable and meaningful, there are other people out there that will feel the same way. And not everybody will, yeah. but you find the others and the others find you. So I just try to do something that's in, in the flavor of everything that I've loved through my life, all the things that have influenced me, you know? Yeah. And, and I'd say one of the, my, my favorites of your works, obviously, is The Shed, which I'm near right Thank now, you. actually. This uh, is not should, fake. Don't, this is don't get too close. Yeah. I've, but it, it was really, really neat to watch that because I've, I've watched uh, all of your other films, all of your other shorts, and it was fun to see something that, to me, honestly, is going to be a classic because it, it it's that it's 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 thrilling it's fun it's simple you're dealing with some interesting themes um do you want to talk about like how that kind of came together for you because that i feel like it is part of your your core guiding principles you want something entertaining but it was sure. 
I left with a, a warm feeling after seeing a vampire movie. I mean, <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, a lot of people ask me about like sort of like the the underlying themes of like you know the school shooter aspects and the yeah. like the, the the toxic aggression and things like that, and none of that was originally like the intention. It yeah. those themes like emerged themselves as we started, you know, writing about the cat. I mean, early on in the process, it was literally just about a vampire in a shed. You know what I mean? It was a very sort of fright night-ish film. And it had, it had the themes of youth and stuff like that. But it, it wasn't until like the third or fourth draft, I think, when we started realizing, me and my producer started realizing, hey, there's kind of this underlying theme of like this, this toxic aggression that could blow up. Yeah. And once that occurred to us, we started really exploring that. And that's what, that's what really, in my opinion, makes it a stronger film. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. It would have been cool just as like straight vampire fun coolness, but having that additional emotional element, I think, um, I don't know, it just helps people connect to it a little more because I think there's a a primal reaction to that. Yeah, I mean that's what's really beautiful about the genre world. We get to choose something that's abstract, and we get to find ways to universally connect it to every social thing that's going on. I mean, it, right now, I, I don't, I'm sure you've noticed a lot of people are taking comfort in films that are basically what we seem to be living right now, almost post-apocalyptic right. circumstances. But what I always loved about those films was not the fantastical circumstances, but how it shows how people act in crisis or how people act when there's crazy transformations, you know? Well, often in, in those films, uh, and I guess often in reality, the horror is not necessarily coming from the, whatever the phenomena is, the horror is not necessarily coming from the vampire. The horror is not necessarily coming from the plague. Yeah. The horror is not necessarily coming from the zombies. It's what people are doing in response to that. Yep. And that's, that's where character is created when it comes to films and literature. You know, really to write a great character is to write a great human reaction to something. Yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah, oh, totally. And I think that that's, that's kind of the, the world you created with The Shed, because it was something that you, you, know, you kept, you were like, okay, you have this, this town, you have this location, you have this you know, insert phenomenon, and then how, do, how does that reveal the way these characters and their circumstances, like how they, will change how it might speed up like the inevitable downfall or rise of different people's humanity and i right. think that that's really important right now because sometimes we can't watch direct you know legit drama as easily as genre genre is easier to i don't know just to like easier to digest in a yeah. way because cuz cuz even when even when a genre film is taking a realistic approach there's always that element of fiction yeah. that in a weird way comforts us. I'm comforted by the idea of vampires and zombies or what, whatever it may be yeah. in, in a weird way because it's a, it's a controlled anxiety that I understand there are no real vampires. Yeah. Yes, many people suck and many <laughs> people are awesome. <laughs> but when you're, when you're watching something in the context of a horror film or a genre film, I feel like the comfort comes from knowing it's not real. At the end of the 90 minutes, whoa, that was scary, that was crazy, but I know that's not real, so I'm okay. Yeah. But it allows your body, I think, to emotionally go, you know, have that, that scare or have that like, oh shit, or have that crying moment, but you're okay because it didn't happen to you. Yeah, uh, it's funny you say that because uh, you said suck. I immediately started thinking about I just watched this uh, comedy special on Netflix. Actually, two really great ones, um, but the most recent one I watched was Seinfeld's latest. And he was talking about a couple things that I think kind of we can relate to the genre community in this conversation, but he said that there is a very small degree between something being great and something sucking. And he was talking about different examples. He's like, oh, like for instance, when you like hit your toe or something, you're like, oh, this sucks, but you go, great, great, great. Like, 
right. <laughs> or like when somebody says a movie, you know, like in the genre community, there are movies that it it's always the, oh, it's, you know, ahead of its time or like, it'll be appreciated. It'll be a cult classic later, or, you know, you have to be crazy to like this movie. And some people will say it sucks and some people will think it's great. And I feel like genre is definitely plays in that realm for better or worse to the point where some people, myself included, will watch movies that I'm told suck because I'm just curious. Right. You know what I mean? I've learned, uh, I always like to form my own opinion and I'll hear that movies suck. I'll hear movies that are awesome. Yeah. I may agree, I may disagree, but I'd rather see it for myself. A lot of movies that people think are amazing, I think suck and vice versa. Yeah. You know what I mean? So. But there's like such a fine line, right? It's like. Yeah. Well, well it's weird because over the past few years too with the genre, it, it I, I feel like a weird thing has happened with like genre fans uh, over the past like five to 10 years where it's like you now it's like you either love something or you hate it. And if you hate it, you really, really hate it. And I'm like, when did, when did genre, like when did horror fans start hating horror so much? You know what I mean? Like they're, they're almost like angry if it's not the best horror movie they've ever seen. Yeah. You know what I mean? And it's like, can you like take it down or not? It's like, number one, it's just a movie. If you didn't like it, life goes on you know yeah well also I, it's it's kind of this cancel culture and just this yeah. idea of like you know what who why are we we're all suddenly the tastemakers right but what i find exciting is like i, I was talking with with ted the other day and mm -hmm. well, not the other day like months ago the, the first time we talked about it but this idea that i do like i do legitimately watch poorly made movies on purpose because at the very least one you know you can say form an opinion but two as a filmmaker I think it's important to assess what makes a bad film like I agree. You can learn more from failure and you can learn more from mistakes than you could ever learn from the fluke of it being a hit because you can't follow up like I, I feel like when you're I said this recently to someone else that when you're working, for me, like working through the film industry, I feel like I've learned more working under bad directors or ineffective directors because you see it, it becomes so obvious when something somebody is doing is ineffective or not working that you're like, oh my God, I, I don't want to do that. I'm not going to do that when I make my movie. When you're working with a, a more skilled individual, it's harder to see what they're doing because things flow smoother. Yeah. Things happen smoother. So the, the ruckus doesn't get your attention, so to speak. Oh, yeah. I mean, indie film, like my experiences, your experiences, we've, you just have to learn to like roll with it. But I definitely have learned, not only just learned about like made my own film school out of the sets I've been on, but also hopefully learned how to adjust my attitude so that like when I do yeah. get to a more like professional you know set that I can make it a, a better experience like for the things that are falling apart you know and yeah. I, I think that you have a very good temperament like in general in life but you know it's you. it's it's a very important thing to have because if people are under your command they need to like sense that you can be trusted to do sure. so, you know i also i also feel like filmmakers all of us should remember that we're lucky to be making films it's really difficult to be make it's really difficult to make a film yeah and it's incredibly difficult to get yourself to the to the point of all right i'm directing my film here whether it's a short a feature whatever it is difficult to get to that stage and then to work through production yeah. and i think it's important to remind ourselves and each other, how lucky we are to be doing what we're doing because it's not easy to do. It's not common. We, I, th I think, we forget how uncommon it is because we're in a group of filmmakers. We talk to other filmmakers that we work with and that we're friends with, so it feels normal to us. But when you get out of the filmmaker bubble, it's a pretty abnormal thing to do, and it's very yeah. difficult to do. And I think, I think it's important to remind ourselves how lucky we are to be doing what we're doing on any level, whether it's a little, very low budget short or like a higher budget feature or anything in between, whatever it may be, 
remind yeah. yourself, hey, this is what I wanted to do and I'm now doing it. So yeah. I should feel good about this. And part of what goes with that is shit going wrong on set. And that's not the time to be a dick. Yeah. Or like, I always think about, uh, I don't know, did you ever watch Lost? I don't know if we've talked about this. I did watch Lost, yeah. Okay, so you know how, um, uh, it's Jack, right? He says like, I allow myself to freak out for like, what was it, like 10 seconds. And in those 10 seconds, right. I like let myself freak out. And then after that, it's gone. I it can't yeah. let back in. I think sometimes like that is my method of dealing with like overwhelm. But the key in, in the film industry I'm noticing is if you are in charge, you got to be like a chill. You got to make sure that you're thinking all of that on the inside because yeah. So because it's, I, think because it's I, think, I, I think when you're in charge on a film, um, when you're in that leadership position, it's it's important to show that you, that you have a plan. And even when things go wrong, you need to maintain the identity of leadership because everybody's gonna look to you and how you react is gonna set the tone of everything. So of course, there were a million times when I was shooting the shed when something made me freak out. Yeah. I didn't freak out on the crew, just in my mind, I was like, oh, fuck. Yeah. But <laughs> that's my problem. So I gotta deal with the oh, fuck, figure it out in like two minutes. Yeah. Cause you got a producer breathing down your neck and your DP has got a problem and everybody's, got, you know what I mean? So yeah. you, you take that, whatever, like you said, if it's 10 seconds, if it's a minute, whatever, yeah. and then you get it together and you come back and you have to display leadership. You have to display, you know, that you're in charge and you got this cause that will make everyone feel better. Exactly. And uh, speaking of uh, like just the creative world, you are also an avid photographer. How did you get started with that? Uh, it just happened. I was, uh, I was always just a, a creative individual since childhood. I would, I was always writing, drawing, or using my dad's video camera. And when I got into high school and I started taking photography, it like, it clicked. It was like magic on day one. I was like, oh, this is what I want to do. I want to like be creating images and telling stories through imagery. And it yeah. just started from there and never never really went away. I think, I think it's definitely connected to your, your visual eye. Like you, you see things, you know, like yeah, I'm the same sure. way. I'm really, I'm really picky, you know, about how things are framed up, even when it comes to like group shots with friends. I mean, it's like, I think that that's, that's part of your disposition and, you know, yeah. but uh, I was wondering what is something that people may not know about you that you feel comfortable sharing, like something unexpected, um that's a tough one I you're, think, you're a mystery man <laughs> i don't know if i'm a mystery man maybe i am but um i love to cook and i love to cook for people i love to cook for my friends and family and what's your I favorite love, meal to make for your friends and family i don't have a favorite meal but any meal that enables me to be cooking for a long period of time while we gather and drink yeah. and eat and like kind of be social around i'm italian so it's yeah. part of my culture you know yeah. so yeah. that might be something people don't know about me um uh, i remember when i when i had i had frank over for dinner the first time i had you over for dinner i was like yeah i'm not gonna cook italian because i'm not even gonna pretend that i'm on your level <laughs> with that <laughs> so i think we cooked you like some thai it was like a, like a thai pasta yeah, yeah. It was really good. It was, it, yeah, I like to do fusion stuff. I guess because that's what I am. I'm a fusion of different cultures and things. So, but cool. yeah, we're learning. We're learning with with the Italian. Shout out to a horror friend, uh, Adam Torkel. He has a Italian restaurant called oh, I love Torkel. Brooklyn, and we've been ordering stuff from them, just like hunks of Parmesan, you know, like good prosciutto, <laughs> awesome. pepperoni. So. We're doing, I like the slow cook. I, I like to make sauces from scratch. Yeah, when okay. we're allowed to hang out again, I will teach you some great sauces. I'm excited. Yeah. I'm excited. I, my, I, I'm like learning all these different ones and uh, there's one kind of tomato sauce I like to make with like hard cider. Where you mm -hmm. do like uh, uh, sauteed onions and hard cider to kind of like caramelize and sweeten it and then you add everything yeah. else. So, Sounds really good. Yeah, so exper I like experimenting with with that. I actually have a 
I'm starting to pregame. Oh my gosh, it's invisible. With my gluten free beer from Omission. It's my gluten full beer. Yeah. Clink. Clink. But, so um yeah we're it's been it's been like really great to like find a way to socialize find a way to watch things and you've also been just like you have your little traditions that uh i know of with uh like you like to do the halloween thing do you want to tell people about that like on halloween what you do normally uh sure i go to uh sleepy hollow every halloween it's like an elaborate thing so that's why i'm <laughs> Yeah, I go up to Sleepy Hollow, which is upstate New York from Tarrytown. Mm -hmm. And I like to walk around this tremendous, beautiful cemetery. It's like, it's the cemetery you feel like you would see in like any like sort of gothic horror movie. It's very hilly, with gnarly trees and mossy stones. Yeah. There's an old church at the hill. So I do that and I have some drinks and I go to the Horseman's Hollow, nice. which is this awesome haunted house experience there. And then I usually cap off the night uh, at the Bridgeview Tavern, which is a nice little bar up in Sleepy Hollow with a, a view of the bridge, hence the name. Yeah. That's pretty that's, much it. That's lovely. I mean, I remember the first time you told me that. I was like, I, I love specific traditions. You know, my we, we, we like to do all sorts of, like, things whenever there's a festive holiday. And Halloween, we usually just end up dressing up as, like, some sort of movie iconic duo that maybe two or three. That's cool too. But you should uh, this year, if you're able to, sometime in the month of October, try to get up to Sleepy Hollow. Yeah. Even if you don't go on the day of Halloween, you could do it any time during October, and yeah. you'll love it. Yeah, we. The last time we actually tried was like many years ago. Was we went to go see Nevermore with um, Jeffrey Combs. Oh yeah. They that was in Sleepy Hollow? No, it was in um, Summerfield, but like oh, okay. you could, we were planning on driving to Summerfield, Massachusetts, and then, you know, veering off, detouring a little bit in Sleepy Hollow, but the exit was so full. It was, it was on Halloween. So we were like, we're, there's no way we can do both. So we just did the one show, but we will, we'll go on October and hopefully, I mean, I don't, I feel like it's easy to be socially distant on macabre, like in morbid macabre type places. So I mean. So they can have some cemeteries. So you could, you could stay six feet away from, from the living. Yeah. I'm actually near a really cool cemetery. The Greenwood one, the Greenwood Cemetery. Oh, I, I love Greenwood. I haven't been there yet. And it's been on my list all last year. I was like, I need to go. I need to go. It's, and I had a really busy fall because I was traveling a lot, but this year I'm definitely going. Yeah, we we actually have gone there for different events. They have like, you know, live music and stuff like that. It's I enjoy it. I mean, it's beautiful. I I have a fascination with cemeteries. So yeah, me too. It's just a thing. Totally, um, I get it. So I wanted to ask you, what would you like me to tell? Um, the universe on your behalf like what would you like <laughs> yeah when you told me this I was thinking I'm like there's so many different things it's but just natural I think the best thing right now would be this isn't funny anymore this isn't funny anymore got it I'm gonna I'm gonna write that down <laughs> okay cool cool yeah no I'm trying to figure out how to convey this to people but yeah no it isn't it isn't that's actually a really good thing to, to end <laughs> But it's funny because I feel like I am finding um, that I'm in the acceptance phase of what's going on. I'm kind of just trying to adapt. And part of that is getting to talk with my friends that inspire me and share that with everyone. So thank you so much for being part of the show. And till next time. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Bye. Bye.